morning. Welcome. On the 14th, we have Ash Wednesday. Ash Wednesday is the beginning of Lent where we will gather in this place and, and we will celebrate with the um, receiving of the ashes on our forehead or on our hand and we'll remember all the work that God has done in our lives to bring us to the point where we can lay down our sins and enter this time of Lent. And Lent is a period of reflection where we reflect for 40 days minus Sundays on the miracles, the temptations, and the trials of Jesus as we look at our own. And we do that building up to Easter where we celebrate that wonderful triumphant rising and resurrection of the Lord which, in which we hold our own resurrection. So thank you for that. And Jude will open us in a word of prayer when we get to worship. Of course. Guys, stand and let's prepare to worship together. So, Father, we just come to you, and we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you that your love never fails us. Father, we ask that you open our spiritual eyes, that you open our spiritual ears to hear and to see everything that you want us to see and hear tonight. Father, I just pray that you would wrap us in your arms tonight. I pray that we would have joy as we worship. I pray that you would meet every single one of our needs, no matter if it's physical, emotional, mental, financially. Father, you just be you. And may we just be your sons and daughters worshiping you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What we do, we pray for the children of this church. We pray for the youth. Our young adults, we pray for people of all ages. Tonight we ask a special blessing on those that are not here that, that you would like to bring into the fold of your word in a new way, on a new night, perhaps with a new song in their voice. We ask that as we share in your word tonight that our lives are opened up to its understanding, that we live out as those who understand and live out the story of Jesus so others may come to know him. It's our personal Savior, you, our Lord. This we pray in that very name, the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. All right. Thank you for being here again. Our scripture tonight is coming up. It's Luke 7, 1 through 10. There you go, Luke 7, 1 through 10. This is one of the stories where Jesus is on his way from one place to another, and Somebody stops him and asks him for something. Go figure, right? All right, so here we go. This is Luke chapter 7, 1 through 10. After Jesus finished presenting all his words among the people, he entered Capernaum. A centurion had a servant who was very important to him, but the servant was ill and about to die. When the centurion heard about Jesus... He sent some of the Jewish leaders to Jesus to ask him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they earnestly pleaded with Jesus. Well, he deserves to have you do this for him, they said. He loves our people and he built our synagogue for us. Jesus went with them and he had almost reached the house when the centurion sent friends to say to Jesus, Lord, don't be bothered I don't deserve to have you come under my roof. In fact, I didn't even consider myself worthy to come to you. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. I'm also a man appointed under authority with soldiers under me. I say to one, go, and he goes. I say to another, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and the servant does it. When Jesus heard these words, he was impressed with the centurion. He turned to the crowd following him and said, I tell you, even in Israel, I haven't found faith like this. The centurion, when the centurion's friends returned to his house, they found the servant restored to health. The miraculous word of God for the people of God. Amen. That's a good story of healing. And in this particular story of Jesus' healing, and then the power of Jesus to not only heal, but have power over sickness and death, we have this centurion who did not even feel worthy to speak to Jesus personally about the healing. 
we see at work here not only the healing, but the principle of extending our perceived boundaries. So whatever you think your boundaries are, this is a story about extending them. Perhaps it would have been closer to the truth to say that we see the overturning of the conventional way we look at the world in this story from Luke. After giving what's called in Luke the Sermon on the Plain, Jesus comes down from the plain and out of the plain into the city of Capernaum. The town will serve as his base of ministry for a while. And we're told that while Jesus is there, there's a centurion. And the centurion has a slave. Centurion is a fancy word for, uh, it'd be like a, a, a chief in the Roman army. You know, the senior enlisted guy. I said senior enlisted. I didn't say the juniorest of officers, right? Come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was probably an old guy. This, this soldier, let's just call him a soldier. He had the slave, but it's interesting because it's not just a slave. In this story, the man values his slave. He cares for them. And this is not necessary that he does this. The law didn't make him value the slave. But the slave that he values has a problem. He's sick to the point of death. And from that little bit of information, we can glean a lot. That Jesus is recognized as a master teacher. Because later in the chapter, it said that a great prophet has arisen among us. Speaking of Jesus in chapter 7, verse 16. So we know that Jesus is someone to be reckoned with. And we know that the centurion recognizes that they have that in common. The centurion, a Roman officer or enlisted senior person in any way you want to look at it, was probably in charge of a company of about 100 grunts, <laughs> foot soldiers, right? And the army's calling them legs, right? He was probably not in charge of all the troops that were there in Capernaum, but he may have been in charge of some they were in the service of Herod, Herod Antipas, the local governor that was appointed by Rome of that region. That this man has a slave that he values is also very revealing. As we mentioned earlier, slaves in this culture, in the Roman law, they were considered living tools. It's like your lawnmower, your rake, your shovel. Your wine press, it's a tool. Roman owners of slaves legally could treat them however they saw fit. When they wore out, they could kill them, sell them off, and just go buy another one. They could punish them even to death if the owner felt it was valid. Slaves were dispensable. So the fact that this man cared enough about this slave that he wanted him healed indicates that the man was good. At least there was something about him that was of good moral. He may even have been compassionate. So he cared for this slave enough. He had enough compassion to at least send someone after Jesus. And all he, we know that he would have known about Jesus is from the stories going around. There were stories going around that there's this man, Jesus, he's been healing folks. He just fed 5,000. You know, he's this miracle worker. And a great teacher. So, the man sins, sins for Jesus. Now, he doesn't go himself. He goes to the back door, right? He finds these Jewish leaders that he is friends with, that he has some pull with, and he asks them to go to Jesus. Later, we find out why. But for now, we know that the man just uses these local Jewish leaders to get his wishes accomplished. He uses them to get Jesus to heal a slave, and we know from the scripture that these elders, these Jewish elders, are very eager to do the centurion's bidding. And they lose no time in trying to convince Jesus, a Jewish teacher, to heal this Roman slave who was neither in Jew nor Gentile. They were just property. In other words, they can, were trying to convince Jesus to heal an outsider. And that's not like the Jews of the day, Right? The outsiders were unclean. 
what was probably their evaluation of the situation, they cared less about the healing of the outsider and that slave and more about doing the bidding of the centurion and making them happy. Because the elders' appeal to Jesus is based not on the fact that the slave needs help, but because of the esteem they hold for the slave's master. It says right there in Luke 4 and 5 of chapter 7, He deserves to have you do this for him. He loves our people and he built our synagogue for us. That stuff like that doesn't happen in the church today, does it? Going after the big givers, you know, because they can build stuff and do stuff and pay for stuff. Obviously not here. Finance committee would be happier with me. <laughs> so, so there's a little pressure, right? These leaders put pressure on Jesus' as teacher. Look, he built the synagogue. He deserves it. It's as if to say, Jesus, you've got to heal the slave for the centurion because we owe him a great deal. We know for a fact that this Roman helped build Jewish synagogues or that the Romans in general helped do that. The Romans felt that it was in their best interest to maintain good order and stability in the community by helping the locals build their little places of worship. Just think about it. What did the Romans care? They had all kinds of gods. What's one more? As long as it didn't cause problems. So without much as a question, Jesus goes with the elders to visit the centurion's house. He was going to see, we imagine from the reading, what he could do for the slave. He said he had almost reached the house when the centurion sent friends to say to Jesus, Lord, don't be bothered. I don't deserve to have you come under my roof. In fact, I didn't even consider myself worthy to come to you. See, now we know why he didn't come. He, the centurion did not feel worthy to personally go to Jesus. It's more than you can say about the Jewish leaders. He says, just say the word and my servant will be healed. The invitation, the invitation is none other than for Jesus to heal this slave boy long distance. Indirectly. Virtually. The centurion did not ask Jesus to come lay hands on him or make mud pies or spit in his hand or say any chants or pray. He just said, say the word. The centurion appeals to what he judges to be the common bond that Jesus and the centurion have as leaders over people. In verse 8 he says, I am also a man appointed under authority with soldiers under me. I say go and he goes and to another come and he comes to my servant do this and the servant does it. The centurion knows how Jesus must feel inside being a man of authority himself. Oh, well, I have this authority. I must use it. He's quite clear that he knows what it means to be under the authority of others and to execute and exercise his own authority. He knows how to take orders and how to give them something he feels that he and Jesus have in common. After all, Jesus has followers. There's people following him around. There's 5,000 people chasing him around the lake. At least. So when Jesus hears of this, he turns to the crowd. I love it when Jesus does this. Quite often, someone will come say something to Jesus. And instead of answering them, he'll turn to the others around and just talk to the crowd. He says, I tell you, even in Israel, I have not found faith like this. Luke concludes the story with some very crucial information. When the centurion's friends return home, they find the slave in good health. So what on the surface looks like a story about healing, miraculous healing, turns out to be a story about faith. We witness in this story the extraordinary faith of an outsider, not a disciple, not one of the extended family, not a Jewish leader, not even a Jew, but an outsider, a nobody as the world would call them, someone that is dispensable and disposable. Some have called these passages the, the message 
within the miracle. Do you notice how the contrast in this story work off each other? If you look at the contrast, then it becomes even more enlightening of what we hear in, in this story. The Jewish elders judge that the slave is worthy of treatment. And Jesus agrees, but for a totally different reason than the Jewish leaders. See, there's this contrast. The elders think that Jesus should heal the boy because of the generosity of the boy's master. He built our synagogue for us. But Jesus is willing to heal the boy because of the centurion's own personal faith and trust. The centurion shows himself to be one who trusted Jesus to heal his servant even from a distance. The Roman officer does not feel like he is personally worthy of even having Jesus in his home or meeting him face to face. Actually, it's out of deep respect for Jesus that he does not want Jesus in his home. The centurion knows that for Jesus, who is a Jew, to enter the home of a pagan Gentile, it would mean that Jesus would become instantly, ritually unclean. Contaminated is how we would translate that. So for this reason, Jesus says, I tell you, not even in Israel have I seen faith like this. Evidently, Jesus was surprised to find such faith and compassion in an outsider like the centurion. So what can outsiders teach us? I mean, if, if even Jesus can learn something from this centurion, and it says in Scripture that he does, because he says, well, I haven't seen faith like this before. The Roman taught Jesus that Gentiles can also believe in him. It's even better, apparently, than some of his own people. Now, we know Jesus is God, and we can go down the well. He knew everything, but the, for the story and for the teaching perfectly fully human and fully divine Jesus learned something. He shared it with others. Outsiders can teach us that we don't have a corner on the market of faith and religious stuff, right? Whether it's in the church or in the world at large, we can still learn from others. Can you think of one thing, this small group we have in here tonight, can you think of one thing that you've learned about Jesus from someone else. Everyone should be raising their hands unless you were just born a theologian, right? So you can raise your hands, really. It's interactive church. Okay. Now, can you think of something that you may have learned about yourself, about your faith in Jesus from someone that doesn't go to church? Or is not? Yeah. Okay. Some have. Maybe not everyone. For us here in the church, I think that is the lesson that we can learn. That Jesus treated the centurion no differently than he did the Jewish elders. He respected them both, at least in this instance. He listened to what each had to say, knowing that Jesus is God and he knows all when the Jewish leaders came and, and talked about the centurion. Jesus knew what their motives were, but in this scripture, anyway, he doesn't confront the leaders. He lets them talk, and he goes with them. If you really think about it, he treated the centurion like he was already an insider. And in the process, Jesus healed a hurting boy, a boy who was not even Jew, not even a Roman, but was a slave, a legally classified nobody. Yet in Jesus' eyes, this boy just happened to be someone after all. The outsider was a fellow human. This outsider was a child of the same God that created us. And this child of God needed help. He was a person of divine worth. And Jesus included the slave boy into Jesus' life. He accepted him just like he would a Jew. And legally, even by Jewish law, he should not have done that. 
So by healing the boy, he accepted him into the life of the Savior. So the moment the church stops acting like a, a club for the like-minded, right? And you've heard that before, maybe. And we begin treating the, the non-members the same as members, then that's the day that the church will really become an outpost for the kingdom of God. And we can talk about examples in our church where we are that, and we've done that, and, and we do accept people. But we can probably think of a few examples where we could do better. But when I say church, I'm not just talking about all faith. I'm saying the Christian church, those that say they're disciples of Jesus, the day that we are willing to reorganize the way that we think about the world, and start living for those who are not yet here, that's when they'll come. See, it's just like earlier. It's like one of those paradoxes. You have to make plans and do things for people that aren't even here. But when you do that, now they're here and they become part of the planning and building and ministry for the rest of the people that aren't here. And that's so you know you're building bigger sanctuaries and and sitting sister churches around in the neighborhood and setting up missions in Africa and South America because you've prepared a place where people want to come because they see Jesus in you and they want some of that. So that's when the outside becomes the inside. And it's not about what we do, right? It's not about what Jesus did. It's about the faith of those who who were in need. So it takes faith to heal. It's not magic, and prayer is how we express that faith, right? But it really, it's not the prayer itself that heals, it's the power of Jesus that we're calling upon in prayer. And we have to believe in that power, so it's about faith. It takes faith to take on the challenges of transforming the world around us. And in the words of Jesus, it takes a faith like this. It takes a faith like the centurion, one that knew nothing about Jesus other than the stories that he's heard. But he wanted to believe. He wanted to participate in the power. It takes faith like this, complete, blind, no strings attached, no excuses, pure faith in the power of Jesus. This expressed in God's unconditional love for us. So do you and do we as a church, or do we think that maybe we as Christians in whole, do we have a faith like this? Or do we have another kind of faith entirely? It's a good question. I think when we start asking those kind of questions and we start hearing God give us these answers, then that's when we begin to transform into a place that looks more like the kingdom and less like, a, what do you call that? Uh, there was like this fancy medieval word for seraph, you know, where you had like this lord in the castle and it has all this, the moat around them. When somebody wants in, they have to come up to the moat and say the magic word and maybe there's this thing where they would put this bucket on a rope and they would put the bucket over to the person on the drawbridge and if they had enough money they could put it in there it's like a toll bridge right and then they could come in another thing they would do was they would put signs on the road at the end of their property and it would be like seeing a street sign right on the highway Jacksonville 30 miles away it would say Lindy's King Castle 30 miles away and they have the sign there and you would know that you better, first you better have invitation or you better be really fast or really cunning because between that line and that castle was a no man's land. And if any of the kings from Lindy's people came and found you, whatever you had was theirs. So it was a race to the castle to the protection. Sometimes I think that's what the church feels like, like we are. You know? We're just sitting here waiting for people to race to us. Right? And if they're good enough, they dress enough, they have enough money or or they speak the right language, or look the right way, or wear the right clothes, well, then they can come on in. So do we have a faith like that? Or a faith like the one that Jesus examples in the Word of God? 
when I think about that, when I thought about it right in the sermon, I can answer both ways. Because I have seen the fruits of your ministry and your love for God, and I've seen the way we welcome people. I also see a lot of empty chairs, so we must not be communicating that very well, right? <laughs> Let's pray about that. Lord God, you communicate to us, not with just words, but with spirit. We read your words and it is interpreted by the spirit that you promise lives within us. And it is through that holy discernment that we live our lives more and more like you every day. So we thank you for giving us the guidance of your word and the interpretation of your spirit that we may truly know what it looks like to love like you. We thank you for bringing people to our doors and for those who open their doors wide, welcoming and including them in. And may we continue to grow, accepting the outsider as they're already an insider. May we model the faith like this centurion that we may just believe and ask and expect it to be given and look forward to receiving the wonderful gifts of your relationship, the love of God, the grace of God given to us. I'm not going to say amen because the communion liturgy is, is actually a prayer. When you look it up, we don't treat it like that a lot of times, but it's a prayer. So we continue in prayer. So we think about that grace, Lord, that you gave us that is your love for us. We think about the sacrifice that you made on our behalf. We think about the way that even though you knew it was coming, you went willingly to a place of persecution, knowing that it would lead to death. So we pause now and we give great thanks to the way you love us, to the depth of your love, the way that it is unconditional, a love that covers all of our sins, a love that says even though our actions may disappoint you, your love for us covers them. And you accept us in, whether we act like it or look like it or dress like it or not. When you met with your disciples that night, trying to prepare them for the time when you would face your death, you took bread, raised it, gave thanks to God our Father in heaven, broke the bread, shared it with all present, said, take and eat, for this is my body given for you. As often as you eat of this, do so in remembrance of me. The meal was over. You again raised the cup, giving thanks to our Father in heaven. Shared it with the disciples and all that were at the table and said, Drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink of this, do so in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of both the mighty acts of Jesus Christ our Lord, the acts of healing, the acts of compassion, the acts of accountability, the acts of love. We accept the nourishment of this meal that we may go in the world and love like Jesus loves and accept like Jesus accepts. May we have the strength of your spirit that remembers the sacrifice you made for us, that we may make the sacrifice of our voices and our lives that others will see what it looks like to live as your disciple. And until the day that we all meet at that heavenly banquet table, we claim you as our Lord. And we look forward to that healing look forward to being covered in perfect love. We pray this name of Jesus our Lord, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. This is the body of Christ broken for you. And the blood of Christ shed for you. The servers come forward. This is an open table. You need not be a member of the church, not a Methodist. Only have a willingness to celebrate the gifts of grace tonight and meet Jesus. You will receive the bread, just come with hands cupped, dip it in the cup, go to the rail, spend as much time at the rail as you like, talking to your father. May the body of our Lord broken for you. Blood of Christ shed for you. Then this is the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, broken and shed for you. Jude, the body of Christ, the blood of our Lord. 
Table is open. Come as you are led. For God, we thank you again for this gift of life. The gift of your life that allows us to come and lay down our sins, confess to you where we have been unworthy and, and have failed to be obedient, knowing by our faith that you have done everything necessary for our forgiveness that you desire to be with us forever, for all eternity. And if we believe that, then we have to believe that you are Lord of healing and of hope. So forgive us, Lord. Heal our sin. Heal our disobedience. Heal our bodies and our minds. And we pause now as a family of God to either lift aloud or from our hearts either the prayers for ourselves or the names of those that we know that need to be touched in a special way by God with healing, with wholeness. We pause and we lift their names. Thank you for being God that's ever ready to hear our prayers even when we are not ready to pray them. So come, Holy Spirit. And Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Join hands with the neighbor, raise them up, receive this benediction. Lord God, we are grateful that you brought us to this place tonight. Now strengthen us by our fellowship and by your word, with song, with our lives, with the way that your spirit wells up in us. Strengthen us, prepare us to go into the world and make insiders out of outsiders remind us that we too were once outsiders when we were brought into this eternal life by your great love so we go in the strength of the spirit we go in peace amen